All right, party. Perspectives on high performance computing in the big data world. The conclusions of why HPC is going to see a tremendous resurgence and a central importance in the world to come. And we can uh, combine with ML to, you know, you should always join people, not fight them. So we need to join ML and AI and to get and use them to, to, to win. Okay, so here we are. Here's the strategy for winning. Um, so this section has uh, two components. So dominantly is the actual computer science issues and challenges and opportunities, both software and hardware. All right, computer science issues. Hmm. Well, as far as I can see, there are lots and lots of questions because a little has been uh, studied. There have been lo lo several actually very promising results, but they haven't been done so much from a computer science point of view, looking at what things depend on and what are the real issues. So we don't know what computations can be assisted by what machine learning. And in maybe there are nine scenarios as I gave or less. Maybe some of them are not really important that we should focus down or focus up. What is the performance both in computer time and capability of the different choices for deep learning or machine learning? And as we're going to get to zetascale computing, what do we do with it? People are thinking about exascale, but um, you can get zetascale. Uh, we have to look at all these algorithms to see how they can be machine learning assisted. And uh, we need to uh, understand um, how we implement this dynamic interplay between the data and the control of the who, who's in charge of what. And uh, between the simulations of the machine learning, which uh, um, I think will be necessary in the, in the more sophisticated versions of these, uh, this, these, this work. I've already pointed out the important analogies between time series and um, simulations, because they're four dimensional time series. Maybe there's some nifty um, analogs between the industry problems and the simulation problems. That would be fun. Um, so we've already said there's been little study of the best neural network structure, especially for these hard problems like predict fields from fields and the data assimilation. Uh, we don't really know how reliably, how big the data set is. It just seems to be quite small at the moment. Uh, and uh, whether that's uh, just an accident of the toy examples we're doing now or really will continue is not clear. I, I'm a little surprised people aren't just going in there and getting exascale and zetascale. I think that's what I would be doing if I was on one of those large uh, uh, NSF or DOE machines. Um, there's lots of interesting um, parallel computing issues because if you think about these parallel problems, I mean, and we do these learning surrogates, we probably, we might find out that while we're running, uh, we have to actually not just calculate, we can't use the surrogate, we have to calculate it from scratch. Because we're gonna presumably learn not just the value, but the error. And then we, you know, we plug in the surrogate uh, parameters and we find the error is huge, so we have to calculate it. Well, that's gonna produce all sorts of interesting challenges for parallel computing. Exciting. And as I said, we really need to understand errors better because we shouldn't be predicting just values, we should predict errors. The results I showed you found errors by comparing the results with the, um, with the simulations. But we need to predict errors and learn the errors. So that, because when we, when we are doing these surrogates, we need to make certain that we can, we uh, actually can get reliable answers. When we need to know if you can actually find errors. I mean, there's a lot of relationship between, I think, statistical physics and this type of problem. Because in statistical physics, you're trying, you have to do all this important sampling to get in through phase space. And it's not clear to me how, when we look at these learning surrogates, which are defined over a phase space, how we make certain that we cover the whole phase space. And uh, I don't think you can, in fact. And so we're going to find cases with points needed, which are not in a part of phase space we studied. So. Those are going to hopefully be flagged. Not in the phase space, not ergodic. We need to do some work there. And that's as far as I know, there's nothing like that being done at the moment. Actually, even in the industry, analog, which must also have 
parts of phase space which they don't cover in their training data. Uh, if we come now to hardware, well, we need to, I mean, in my opinion, we're not doing the best job we could on actually designing hardware for the big data um, HPC convergence, uh, partly because I think people are still sitting in two camps. They should be sitting in one camp. And we better take the best, I, unfortunately, we probably will have to take the best of cloud computing because the cloud computing camp is this big and HPC is that big. And so it can't actually assert too much. Only if we can only assert things that they're absolutely essential to get good performance. If they're just essential to accommodate the history of HPC, then they're not going to survive. So we need to look at everything that HPC does and see what's essential and what's history. So if we now want to do HPC for ML, which is what we studied, well, we certainly need to have good communication because we're going to do parallel machine learning. And those are parallel algorithms are at least as hard as the, um, as the ones in simulations, things like latent Dirichlet allocation and graph computations, both of which were done at this HPDC conference. Those are very challenging parallel algorithms, comparable in difficulty to the difficult uh, simulation algorithms. And so we have like graph algorithms have high synchronization overheads. LDA can be very load imbalanced. Um, we do not know um, <coughs> when deep learning will be suitable for GPUs because some papers claim that actually CPUs are better for the recurrent neural nets, uh, which are the variant of deep learning we're using in time series. And um, of course, we know that GPUs are better than CPUs. So all of these issues need to be borne in mind in HPC for ML. And we are going to need fast local disks and accelerators, the GPUs and FPGAs and so on. And we always will need, I think all machines need high speed networks. Unless of course we're only doing pleasingly parallel problems when we can get away with much lower speed networks. But the, 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 the leading edge, Applications, I think, will always need high-speed high high networks for both the HPC for ML and ML for HPC. So now coming to ML for HPC and the hardware needed. So we have to do both simulations and data analytics and their integration. And their integration is possibly there are going to be two jobs running, and these jobs will intermix with each other. And we need to support that intertwining of ML and HPC. Dynamic auto genes certainly has that. And these um, time series jobs will also have that feature the, where, we're tr where we're going to have to, as a function of time, in and run, switch back and forth between machine learning and simulation. And so that says we're going to need machines where we can spread the, the simulation and machine learning throughout the machine in a sort of homogeneous fashion, which suggests that uh, an architecture where Every lo locally you can do either, and that and if they have different accelerators for machine learning and simulation, that's going to be particularly interesting. We will always need fast communication, but we'll also need fast I/O because we're going to produce lots of data to actually exchange information between these two components, and they have to be sent both uh, between. Uh, Threads on a, on a given node and, pos and probably between nodes. And so we, this will be pretty challenging hardware. I don't think it's exhibited in current systems. Now we have a single slide with conclusions. Four conclusions. Well, even though HPC is not thriving by standard metrics, it is not disappearing by standard metrics and it's sitting there okay because we have these future. Which future is exciting? Everybody needs systems, and we just need to align our communities better so we don't get the big industry systems community reinventing all the HPC ideas. Um, so one way we can help this happen is to collaborate with industry, which is the dominant systems people in this field. And an idea I mentioned, a trivial idea, was working with MLPuff. MLPuff is not trivial, just the idea of working with it is trivial. I mentioned the global AI modeling supercomputer, which is the overall framework we should be developing. That supercomputer must support ML for HPC and HPC for ML. We're going to have, tr and we also need to link to the edge, training on the cloud, inference, and training on the edge. 
And uh, the last part of my talk was about ML for HPC and HP or HPDC. It's incredibly promising. We're going to get our Zeta scale performance before it. At the same similar time, do people bring up exascale machines? We need to look at the hardware and software <coughs> for general ML assisted speed up of computation. And I gave you some examples, exciting examples from an IU where we were doing nano and bio um, applications where we can actually engineer your health. We're going to do nano devices built using nano simulations, which are ML assisted. And we're going to do bio simulations using digital twins of uh, your disease running around in your tissues. And that's all going to help you be better and happier. So this is ML. This is HPC for good. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you've enjoyed this talk. It, I certainly have enjoyed giving it. <laughs>